Hello everyone, we're Mark Griffiths and Laszlo the Podcasting Cat, he's down here somewhere and we are bringing you the latest Ask Wrexham. Sorry, you've been a bit hectic lately, so I haven't done for a couple of weeks, but we'll do a double header now. So I'll record a couple, I'll put one out on Friday and then one out in a couple of days' time. But uh, yeah, the season's coming to a nice boil. Seems like a nice time to start answering some questions. So Ask Wrexham, of course, the podcast where we answer your questions about anything you want to do with Wrexham and football. If, you, if you're that way inclined and you just want a bit of extra info, it's our pleasure to deliver it. Can I just point something out first, though, in my Hall of Fame? Thank you very much, Beer Bear Beer, who brought along this rather lovely aged IPA and gave it to the Wrexham player commentary team. Right, we're storing this until we get promoted. Let's hope I don't have to store it for more than a couple of a week or so, because I don't want to hang on to it for another year. It, it ages well, apparently, but let's be honest. Oh, as Laszlo attacks the microphone, good boy. That's it. Stop people hearing what I'm saying. You have their best interests at heart. He's after it now. Um, yeah, let's hope that's something we can enjoy in a week or so. Okay, anyway, on to the questions. And A. Fennel has an excellent question here about those offsides. My first year being a Wrexham fan and any kind of football fan, you made a wise choice, were the Notts County guys deliberately letting Palmer get ahead? Is that a tactic? If so, can anything be done about it? Well, this sounds like an early excuse to go straight to the old tactics board. Right, so this is how Notts County lined themselves up if we were to have the ball deep in our own half, roughly, and how we lined up to combat it. So Notts County would play a very, very high line. They would push their centre-backs right up to the halfway line. And, yeah, perfectly legal. And the thing is, they did it to quite an extreme. Now, this enables them to press more effectively. So, as you can see, it's very congested now in this part of the pitch. They played a box midfield. So a midfield in the shape of a box, basically, which makes it hard to pass through the middle of them. And if their wing backs step up and go onto our wing backs, as you can see, it's not easy, really, to get your way out of there, is there? You know, well, Connell can pass it maybe to Tozer, who helps onto Tunnicliffe, but then they'll all shuffle across. And so they're basically challenging us to try and find a way to pass through them and take risks because if they win the ball back in our half obviously it's more dangerous this comes down to that whole idea of pressing uh, being an attacking approach Klopp who gets his teams famously to press to put pressure on the ball in the opposing half although pressing is more complex than just that when one bloke goes running around chasing the ball and someone says it's pressing it isn't but he says pressing is the best number 10 you know, number 10 being the creative player so pressing creates chances Guardiola famously with his Barcelona side would give them five seconds to win the ball back after they've lost it before dropping off but Notts County were relentless in this it was quite an extreme interpretation of the high line if, if I can just clarify one of the reasons why they're doing it if their defenders had a more sort of orthodox line around here say then there's suddenly a lot of space and their players will have to drop off more. And therefore, we do have time to pass the ball about and move it around like we normally do. So they have to have a high line so that they can congest these parts of the pitch so that we can't pass the ball freely and easily about. So you see what I mean? So one of the reasons why they're doing this is to try and squeeze the whole game into a half and if we want to pass our way through, we're going to find it extremely difficult. Now, the other reason... Oh, oh, by the way, I would also say for people who are watching football for the first time, if you're at an actual match, because on TV it doesn't work as well, one of the best things you can do to understand what's going on is look at where the space is on the pitch. Where is their room? How are tra players trying to exploit that? How are they trying to get the ball forwards? Now, I'd argue that at our best, Wrexham are a team that have patterns of passing, short passing that, and movements which can open teams up. And I'd argue that often, when we're not playing well, we will resort to knocking it long over the top and hoping that the pace of Mullin will get us into a, a good position. 
And I can't help feeling that the other part of why Notts County did this was to challenge us to do that. They wanted us to not feel we can pass around freely in our own half. They wanted us to knock long balls over the top because this space is so inviting behind the defenders. That's why Slocum, the keeper, his starting position will be quite high up, so he'll have a good chance of intercepting it and getting there before the strikers. And if you think about it, the straight ball forwards, the straight long ball forwards, is the most difficult ball in football to get right because the ball goes, you hit it, it bounces, it will bounce on. It's straight away, the moment you hit it, it's getting closer and closer to the keeper. And once it gets into the half, further and further away from the player who was trying to chase it. So, you know, the, the odds are that most long straight passes will bounce through to the keeper or they'll just go straight out of play. So, they're, they're, it's a gamble because obviously if you get it right your defence is in a lot of trouble. So you said in the question, what can you do to counteract it? Get it right, <laughs> if you like. Now, I felt in the first half, we were a bit too direct and doing it too often. We were putting the pressure. We don't f trust playing the ball in short in case we lose it. So we'll knock it long and then it'll go through or Mullen will chase and get beaten to it. Um, as I said in the podcast of the match, I, I, I sort of revised my opinion a bit because when you saw how many offsides were given that weren't offside, actually, to be fair, maybe we were getting it right. But a lot of those did still go through to the keeper. And at half time, Che and I were saying that we really would like to see Wrexham put in an extra pass in midfield so that instead of hitting it long from there, where it's much more difficult to be accurate, you're hitting it from, say, here. So it's an easier pass. You don't have to go aerial to bypass all these players. You can maybe, if you find a space a bit higher at the pitch, just play it on the floor where it's much easier to measure that pass. And that is exactly what we did in the second half. So if you think about what happened in the second half, James Jones got the ball here and was extremely intelligent, I thought, because it, it was the sort of position where in that first half we were just knocking it. But he decided not to, and instead... He helped it on. I don't know, back was a bit further back, wasn't he? He helped it on to Barnett, and then he made a curved run. So he didn't just run directly behind, because that then is easier to run offside. He falls into the trap. He made a curved run to get down the flank and timed it well. And Barnett did really well because he waited until Jones had gotten to a good spot and was running into an area which would cause danger, but played the pass before he was offside. So he knocks it there. Jones runs onto it. Mullen is now tearing in the middle. Cameron has gone with him. Cameron attempts, if you look on it, to block Mullen off and foul him off the ball, but isn't strong enough, and Mullen gets past him, and as Cameron tries to recover, Cameron loses his balance and he falls, and Jones plays a terrific first-time pass in, and Mullen pops it in the bottom corner. Great finish. So we opened them up. So you see, it's perfectly legal, and it can work brilliantly, but it is high risk, because you can open them up like that. And then the second goal, well, for me, I mean, this was incredibly sloppy from Notts County. I was astonished at this. Um, free kick on the flank. O'Connell came up to take it. Mullen made a, a similar curved run to Jones. Mullen is so switched on. Watch, watch him when there's a free kick and he thinks there's a chance, a, a gap in the defence, he'll move. And if the other Wrexham players are switched on, they'll they'll spot it. And O'Connell did. And it was, I mean, you think about all the hard work Notts County had put in exercise, uh, applying this high line and then they just fell asleep. They let Mullen, the most dangerous player we've got, make this run. O'Connell saw it, fed it down the right and Mullen is away and we're all charging down the pitch now and Mullen eventually is able to knock the ball into the far post of course and Mendy was there to finish um, so they really that, that that was the risk, that was poor That was, I'm sure that Luke Williams would have been livid about that and then of course the third one again came down the right hand side and it was a brilliant piece of improvisation of course of O'Connell because you don't see this very often but you know, as you saw it can be done, O'Connell chips it over them and then chases it himself. Now, you can't be offside if you play your own pass. He hasn't really passed it. He's just given it to himself. And he's bypassed them all in one go. I mean, what a brilliant piece of improvisation. It was wonderful. And they were opened up again. So it's a very high-risk approach. I mean, if you look at teams like, say, Klopp, Liverpool under Klopp, um, a couple of seasons ago, they lost the game 7-2, wasn't it? It was 7-2. He's definitely letting 7 at Aston Villa. Because sometimes with this high-risk approach... 
once it goes wrong, once the wheels fall off, the wheels have fallen off and you can collapse, even a great team like that. But, you know, it's it can work as well. I mean, Liverpool have won a lot of trophies uh, playing like that. So have Guardiola's team. So it's a risk. And that's why I find it so fascinating when teams do something a bit extreme because you've got to work out a way to circumvent it. I would say Chesterfield did the same thing to us at the start of the season. It worked like a dream when we lost 2-0. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a gamble. So I hope that was helpful. Um, my old retro Wrexham training top is already more cat hair than whatever. It's made out of polyester. I don't know. Anyway, let's get to the next question. Milon Mush uh, responding to Wrexham Anorak. Can you talk more about Tommy Bamford? His numbers look like pure legend in club history. In fact, I'd love to hear about any of the old timers. Well, here's the original old timer to bring you a bit of info. I mean, Bamford... His records, nothing short of ludicrous, quite frankly. Uh, he was a, a remarkable striker. He did play a couple of times for Wales. He came to Wrexham and immediately started scoring goals and, as a result of it, earned a move to Manchester United. But yes, he's the only Wrexham player to have scored over 200 goals in in his Wrexham career. And I'll just bring up the... Um, the stats and you'll you'll hear some quite remarkable things about him because his time at Wrexham was nothing short of outrageous. Just to put that over 200 goals comment into context, only six players have ever scored over 100 goals for Wrexham. So that's quite something. So anyway, <clears throat> to talk about him in context... Like I said, six, I beg your pardon, seven Wrexham players have scored 100 or more. So Tommy Bannon, who was a centre forward in the 50s, he scored exactly 100. Um, <clears throat> Ron Hewitt, who was uh, an uh, inside forward, sort of, sort of like an attacking midfielder in today's parlance, who played after he left Wrexham in the 1958 World Cup for Wales, he scored 111. Then in fifth place is Gary Bennett, who was a legend in the mid-90s for Wrexham. He scored 114. Graham Whittle played for Wrexham throughout the 70s, and he scored 117. Then in third place, Carl Connolly, who played for Wrexham in the 90s and was a brilliant wide attacking player who then also converted and played in the middle of attack. He scored 133. In second place, Arvon Griffiths. Now, Arvon Griffiths, one of the great figures, played more games for Wrexham than anybody else, 714. And, I beg your pardon, 722, beg your pardon, shocking that, isn't it? And he scored 142 goals, but Bamford, right, Bamford played 241 games and scored 207 goals. Wow. Now, to go even further, if you talk about goals per game, and we're talking here about... So, I, I, OK, I, I'm not able to do it per minute, so I've just done it per appearance. Um, Bamford has scored more... Well, the, has fewest games per goal of any Wrexham player in history. 1.19 games he'd score, so virtually scoring a goal a game. Um, if we take 50 goals at least as a benchmark, the player with the next best strike rate is Mullin. In fact, he's the only one anywhere near Bamford, 1.21. Then you've got Gary Bennett in third place, 1.54. He had two spells with us, and he's actually slightly better in his first spell than his second. Jack Boothway, who was a player who played for us in the 40s and 50s and, and had a very explosive start to his career. He scored 67 goals at a rate of 1.67. And then Mickey Metcalf, who was, a, again, a striker in the 60s, who had some excellent cup exploits, scored a hat-trick against Blackburn Rovers, the first top-tier team Wrexham ever beat. Um, he scored at a rate of 1.99, so pretty much just bang on a goal every two games. So there's only five players who scored a goal every two games... Bamford and hot on his heels, Mullin. Well, they 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 were streets ahead of the rest. Incredible, that isn't that really? Um, more stats on Bamford. Most goals scored by a Wrexham player in a season. That's in all competitions. The most Bamford, fifty goals in nineteen thirty three thirty four. Then third place, 
Bamford, 45 goals in 1930-31. Uh, by the way, fourth place at, at the time of recording is Mullin with 44. Fifth place, Bamford, 40 goals, 1932-33. And even <laughs> keeping going, um, t equal 10th place, Bamford in 1931-32 with 33 goals. And, and that's all his complete seasons for Wrexham. So, not bad. Most league goals in a season? Go on, have a guess. Bamford, 44 in 1933-34. Then, at the time of recording, Mullins next. Then, it's Bamford with 34 goals, equal of Andy Morrell in his phenomenal 2002-2003 season when he was top scorer in the country. Go down a couple more places, past Albert Mays in the 1920s and Gary Bennett in 1933-34. And you've got Tommy Bamford, 31 goals in 1932-33. And then behind him, Tommy Bamford, 30 goals in 1931-32. He also got a 25 in 29-30 and a 24 in 30-31. So, not bad at all. That's, that's wrong, isn't it? Because he's already said 30-31. Hmm, I'm suspicious. I need to look into this a little bit more. Anyway, so Bamford, remarkable figures. Oh, you want more remarkable figures? Okay, go on then. Most hat tricks ever for Wrexham. So you've got Jack Boothway, Carl Connolly, Juan Ugarte, and Paul Mullen on four. Then you've got Gary Bennett and Andy Morrell on six. And in first place, Tommy Bamford with 16 hat tricks. 16. Hat tricks, good lord! Um, most hat tricks in a season, Bamford with six. Next most, Bamford, Ugarte, and Mullin with four. Next most, Bamford, Bennett, Mays, and Morrell with three. It's, it's all Bamford. I mean, it's just terrifying. More than three goals in a game. Okay, most goals ever scored by a Wrexham player in a game was Andy Morrell in a Welsh Premier Cup game against Merthyr Tydfil. We beat them 8-0. Morrell scored seven of them. That was in February 2000. And then you've got four times a Wrexham player scored five goals in a game. And that would be Lee Jones in 2002 against Cambridge. Juan Ugarte in 2005 against Hartlepool. And wait for it, Tommy Bamford twice, 1934 against Carlisle and against New Brighton in 1934 when we won 11-1, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, he also scored four goals in the game four times. <sighs> more? You want more? You say you want more? Oh, go on then. Top scorer in uh, a season for Wrexham. So Bamford, like I said, he had five complete seasons and he was top scorer at each one of them, both in terms of league and overall all competition goals. So I think it's fair to say the, the lad did pretty well. Yeah, not bad at all. Um, Janie Lightning, it's a cracking question. This I think, I, I, please correct me if I'm wrong, I think... This is interesting because it shows the difference between American sport and British sport. She asks, how does moving first team players to the reserve team impact the quality and depth of the full first team? Underused players need exposure in minutes, but can it make a first team player lose their edge? Is it hard for players like Young, McFadgen, Ford, Waters, etc. to switch back and forth? Right, now, firstly, and, and please, like I say, correct me if I'm wrong... Am I right in thinking that, you know, you're going to have in American sports more like your feeder teams and, and you have to officially drop people down and back up again? Maybe I'm wrong on that. Uh, you certainly don't have to uh, in uh, in football over here. Uh, in some competitions, you have to register players, a certain set number of players. Um, but basically, if a player in the National League is registered to the club, you can pick him, basically. Um, how does it affect the depth of the first team well yeah absolutely i mean reserve football is certainly not as intense as for first team football and therefore it's feasible that players might you know not get the, the proper experience 
uh, compared to full time. It was a proper competitive top of the table game. Having said that, I mean you, you can't. I don't think you would legislate too much for that. I think you would be inclined to say if a player is getting minutes in reserve team, they're getting their sharpness. Uh, I would say there's a difference between uh, actually being fit and being match fit. In terms of you can be physically fit enough to play a game, but I think actually you need a few games under your belt to actually really be going at top level, your top level. I'd say reserve football's generally considered to be able to achieve that, even though it's not maybe as intense as a proper first team football. Um, although I must point out, until this season, we didn't have a reserve team. We historically have all teams used to, but we haven't had a reserve team due to lack of funds for quite a few years now. And it's brilliant that the owners have put us into a reserve league this season and we are actually able to do this. Um, but there are other models. Uh, Brentford, for example, don't have a reserve team, but they, they arrange tournaments and friendlies and all, all, you know, to, to, to keep their players sharp anyway. So there's a few different ways of doing it. I would say certainly by this sharp end of the season, the players you're mentioning, you'd be looking at them and thinking, well, I... You know, we may want to use them, but none of them have been in the first team for a while. Are they ready to go and, and straight into an intense situation like this? I guess Parkinson only knows that, looking at training and the rest of the coaching staff. Now, John Davis, who's the dressing room DJ. Now, the stalwart DJ Dibs has left. Um, well, it's Ben Toza. In fact, Toza took over before Dibble left as well. So, yeah, Ben Toza apparently who has a very broad taste in music. I'm reliably involved. Deep State Winston. I never thought about it until just this moment, but it, do I, in a moment like that, which is, you know, going nuts with Notts County penalty save, ever wish he didn't have commentary duty and just cut loose in total celebration with friends and other fans? Oh, that's something that's been in my mind for years, I tell you. Uh, honest answer? I think maybe, well, okay, no, 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 let's take this a different way around. I've always felt that commentating means I know I've got a job to do, and therefore I tend to get a bit less excited probably and feel maybe a little less when it's good, but then the, the flip side of that is that I tend to maybe not feel so bad when things go wrong because I'm trying to keep it level if that if you see what I mean. So yeah, gives with one hand, takes away with the other. Having said that, I, I've got to be honest and say um, that despite outward appearances, I, I'm I'm fairly shy, really. And I think probably that penalty save on the Dover game, that, that's me cutting loose, really, I think, I guess. But um, yeah, I, I, I sort of, part of me wishes I could, but another part of me thinks, okay, so I would swap out getting to go to games and commentate and do all the fun things that I get to do, would I swap that for going absolutely insane when Wrexham score? Nah, I wouldn't, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> I'd rather enjoy it. I, they, I went through a spell of thinking how, you know, like a sort of contrived, how do you um, acknowledge a goal? And for years, in like the 90s, I used to say the score, 5-0, 1-0, or whatever, you know? And then I realised that, although I thought I was being original, um, David Coleman, who was one of the famous commentators from the 60s, 70s, did that. Uh, was it Brian Davis? Oh, whichever one it was. I, I then realised, oh, that was his thing. So I think I'd subconsciously nicked it. So I stopped. Um, now I, So now it is more spontaneous. I just go a bit nuts, to be honest with you. <laughs> and it's fun. Daniel Dunor says, Never been addicted to a team before, and I followed a lot of teams and a lot of sports. How do you get through the week waiting on the weekend? What am I going to do between seasons? I'm hooked. Good lad, that's the spirit. Well, hopefully between seasons we can get lots of content out for you anyway to, to fill the void for you. So that that's one hope. Um, How do I get through the week? I've got to be honest with you. God, I love doing all this stuff. It's really time consuming. Um, So if I'm honest, I get through the week by doing stuff either from the previous match or the next, building up to the next one, or preparing for the next one. So, sad answer is, I have no problem filling my time, I'm afraid, especially as I'm working as well. Um, but yeah, I, I watch other football, watch other sports. I love watching um, cricket. Obviously, that's very seasonal. 
I love watching cycling as well. Um, so, yeah, my, I managed to fill my time. It's nothing, not, nothing compares to Wrexham game, though. Chris says, I hear a lot about this side being a League One side but I think they can easily mix it in the championship. Do you agree? And what tweaks would you make to the side to improve the squad for championship status? Again, superb question. I've I've got an, a sort of... How can I put this? I'm going to qualify it by saying um, one step at a time. So in terms of tweaks, I will answer your question, don't worry. But I, I would say that there's been a natural development in the squad and I think that would continue. So if we were at the point where we're challenging for the championship, you know, that that question, yeah, the situation might be different and my answer would be different. Um, could, but anyway, first part of the question, could we mix it in the championship? Well, I mean, when you see Sheffield United, who are still probably going to go into Premier League, um getting troubled by us and especially at Bramall Lane when we rotated our team quite heavily you start thinking okay what are the upper limits for this club and um, likewise I know this is not on the pitch but the, the insanity around the Notts County game and the amount of worldwide coverage that we got does really open your eyes to just how brilliant this business plan is are we you know able to monetize our popularity to the extent that yeah maybe yeah, maybe we would be able to, to push further uh, than we maybe thought. Um, when you look at the way Mullen terrified Sheffield United's defenders who will be playing in the Premier League this season, or have already played in the Premier League, you saw something. So could we mix it with the Championship? I mean, I assume we'd be lower reaches if we were in, in there, but we've certainly got a lot of decent players. I think the point is that in terms of what tweaks you'd make, I think a general answer is... Well, look what we've been doing already. I would argue that the signings you've made since January are with an eye to hopefully being in the Football League. Apart from adding great depth, it means that we've got terrific depth for a League 2 team as well. Remember, you know, times are hard. A lot of squads will be work operating on much thinner squads. Um, and also that we're bringing in players of a quality who we know should do well in League 2 as well. So we're bulking out that squad with quality. I think that would essentially be a process that would continue. Where would we look to do that? I don't know. I'd be a bit. Where are obvious areas of weakness? Which of these players couldn't perform in the football league? Oof, I, I wouldn't say that any of them obviously couldn't in the first team or most of the backup players as well. I mean, we think that that midfield of Young, Jones, and Davis, you can add in Lee, Cannon, and O'Connor. I mean, hell's bells, what, what, what more depth do you want? So, yeah, I think I'll chicken out. Oh, Laszlo's gone. See you, pal. Um, I think I'll chicken out and say I don't know what tweaks I'd make because the situation would be different if we were in a position to challenge for the championship because it'd be a couple of years down the road. But certainly I feel comfortable with uh, Parkinson's ability to build a squad. Rex FC Boston. Um... Now this, I, I apologize. I said I had a backlog, and I, I really wanted to answer this question, even though I know the game's passed now. So apologies for for going back to it, and apologies, Rex Mepsi Boston, for taking so long to get round to it. How do you feel winning the league despite a loss to Notts County? If both get promoted under that scenario, how much grief will Notts give Wrexham about who the true champion is? I know, win the league, but a fun debate. Well, firstly, you're dead right. I mean, if that happened, if we won the league, Notts County came second, um, and Notts County had beaten us, as they did at Notts County, yeah, I'm sure there'd be an awful lot of uh, ribbing that we'd take from them, which is all part of the fun. Um, but you're right, you answer your own question. If we'd lost Notts County, but we still won the league, I would be, I would take that. I would take your arm off. I just want to win the league. I don't care how. It is a great football cliche about, you know, Oh, teams had a bad season, but they won their derby, so it was a, so it was a successful season, yeah. Oh, Everton are rubbish, but they beat Liverpool, so the fans are happy about the season. I do not think that's true at all. You hear it so often in, in British football. Honestly, honestly, you 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 finish ninety seventeenth, but you beat your rivals. It gives you pleasure on that day. It gives you a chance maybe to crow about it for a bit, but you know. 
Uh, well, uh, well, uh, to give you an example, or oh, maybe this is a bad example, I was going to say there's a famous game in Chester's history where, unbelievably, we're heading, we're, we're tilting at promotion. Chester, a rock bottom, and had one of those sort of historically catastrophic seasons where they're sort of clearly relegated by about February. And somehow they drew at the race course. And it was just a, a combination of all the things that would make it wonderful if, if you were a fan of theirs or horrible if it was if you were a fan of us. Um, Gary Bennett, who I mentioned earlier, was an ex-Chester player. He missed a penalty against them. Uh, and then they had two players sent off, and yet somehow, with nine men, managed to equalise and get a 2-2 draw. It was awful. Now, I, I know that's a bad example. That probably is... A point where you'd think, okay, they still talk about that. Andy Milner scored a winning goal, the equaliser, uh, with nine men, and they call it St Milner's Day, and they still go on about it. So there is an example of a, a, a memorable game in the midst of disaster. Would they have swapped that for not getting relegated, though? I think they would. I think if they look in themselves, I think they would say, I'd rather not have this bad team that came up with one amazing performance I'd rather try and continue and try and build. I would say. I would say. So I yeah, I would. I wouldn't care as far as I was concerned. If Notts County beat us ninety nil and we won the league, <laughs> ah, we win. Perfect. Um, Canadian Red nineteen seventy. Talking about the co-chairman. Um, that's as long time as they're aware of. Long timer. I'm, I'm but a child. Uh, has there been have there ever been owners that are front and center with the fans like Rob McElhenney and Ryan Reynolds? In CFL and NFL, you never ever see it. Okay, now then, I my limited knowledge of uh, American sports, I, I can still name some club owners, or franchise owners who are high profile. Um, when John Henry's won the John Henry, isn't it? Won the World Series. He's there with his crazy novelty 10-foot cigar and stuff on the pitch. Uh, and, of course, I mean, heck, even I've heard of George Steinbrenner. George, George, get me a calzone. Yeah, Seinfeld, you know what I mean? Anyway, that was a great Larry David impersonation, wasn't it? Um, so it varies. It varies. In football, it varies as well. You get some quite high-profile people who love being in the middle of it all. Generally, you don't. I don't think... It's certainly not common, I would say, to have the the sort of clear bond you can see between the owners and the players and, you know, them coming on the pitch and the, the, the players all buzzing off it and loving it. I mean, maybe that's partly due to their celebrity. But I don't know if you see as much of that genuine, sincere, you know, they're often they're celebrating with the team. You know, with the women's team, for example, when they won the league, it felt natural. It wasn't, you know, them, the owners sort of jumping in on the party, which I think with some owners you would feel. It did feel natural, and the team were delighted to, for them to join them. So I think in that sense, it's really unusual, the sort of unforced sincerity of they're part of the team. We all know that we owe all this great stuff to them and we're happy to share it with them. And they clearly love it, absolutely love it. There's no affectation. Clearly there's no desire to get publicity. Um, it's just sheer joy. Um, so in that respect... Yeah, you don't see you don't see it massively. You don't tend to see owners come on the pitch. You do, but it tends to be because they're egomaniacs. Whereas this is the opposite. This is guys who don't need to, to massage their egos anymore, but just having a great time. So in that sense, I'd say it's fairly unique. I, I'm inclined to agree. I think owners who come on the pitch often are ones that um, are looking for people to to pay attention to them. Uh, there's a great example in Greek football of a club owner who went on the pitch. Wasn't he? Was with Nottingham Forest at some point. Is he even now? Greek for owner came on the pitch with a gun under his belt. Um, hmm, that was a different experience. Uh, yeah, I think generally. I mean, the thing with Rob and Ryan is, like I said, there's no ego involved. I mean, so, something that hugely amused me, because you still hear the odd person being cynical, but it really amused me that when a takeover was 
had gone through, you'd occasionally hear people saying, oh, they're only buying Wrexham so they can make a documentary about it, or they want to get on the telly. And it's like, I mean, of all the stupid comments, Ryan Reynolds, one of the biggest movie stars in the world, and Rob McElhenney, creator and star of the longest-running live-action sitcom in American TV history, they want to get on the telly, and that's why they bought a football club. I don't think they need to get on the telly by doing that. Absolute nonsense. So, yeah, it's it, there's none of that desire for publicity, except for how it benefits the club. But it is, it is wonderful and, and spontaneous, isn't it? Daniel Dunor, again. Now then, doing yourself down this time, Northern Danny. I think I, I thought I understood. I think I thought I understood marking in football better than I actually do. Can you explain marked and unmarked? I hear it all the time, but I feel I'm missing some nuance. Is marking just covering a player? Um, to be honest, I don't think you are missing a nuance. Essentially, marking is picking up a player. Um, so if you want an example of unmarked, Cameron's goal against Wrexham on Easter Monday for Notts County, where he's managed to lose his marker, so the marker is the person picking you up and watching you, and so he's completely on his own. He's unmarked and heads it in, whereas marked means obviously the player watching you is with you. Um, and that, I, I, I've been racking my brains to think about whether there is more nuance to it, and <laughs> I don't think there is really. Um, you often you maybe talk about it more on set pieces, you know, so restarts of the game, corners, free kicks, where because then you've you're gonna have a, a system or a structure. You're gonna have a decision made about how to mark particular players on the other side. Um so it's sort of pre thought. But not completely. If a player in open play like um ran down like Mullin for the first goal, or admittedly sort of shrugged off his marker, uh, Cameron again, who fell over. And Mullen was all on his own, so he was unmarked in open play, wasn't he? Because the player who was supposed to be with him wasn't there. Um, I will raise one little thing. It's a slight bugbear of mine. And it's about how you mark on these restarts, the set pieces. Now, the traditional old-fashioned way would be what they call man marking. Uh, basically, the obvious, what you're saying there. One person marks somebody else. And that still happens, you know, throughout football. And if you go into changing rooms, you might, so if you see the plans of coaches, you might see they've got the flipboards and on it will be who marks whom. So which Wrexham player marks which Notts County player, for example. And they would look there at um, height and jumping ability and, and aerial threat, if you will. Look at, look, actually, actually, I spit it around, look at it the other way around. Ben Toes has got a long throwing. So you're going to have to have some sort of plan to deal with that. So... Who's the Wrexham player you think is most dangerous? Aaron Hayden, because he can fly. So you put your best header of the ball on him. Then who else have you got to deal with? Oh, you've got Palmer. Hang on, they've sent up Tunnicliff as well. So do you see what I mean? Mullen is good in the air, even though he's not massive. So you're then judging which players you put on which opponent. But here's where my bugbear comes. Um, well, sort of this century, really, the start of this century... Uh, the public became aware of a, a different way of approaching it called zonal marking. And what zonal marking is, in terms of a set piece, is that your defence has set areas to defend, if you will. So no matter who the opposition are, you will have somebody at the near post, a defender defending around the near post area another one in the middle of the six yard box another one in the far post area another one around the penalty spot do you see what i mean so the idea is it doesn't matter what the other team do you formulate what you think is a good plan for to cover all the areas of danger and then you don't tell players to mark as such they're marking that zone they're responsible for what happened in that area of the pitch now this is where i get grumpy about this because it's a perfectly legitimate way to set things up. And <laughs> and yet, the media, so often the media is dumbed down. Um, just It's full of old footballers who were, you know, in my day we didn't do it like this. So they complain like crazy. Oh, this is stupid, this is, it doesn't work. And they'll point out every time a side defends zonally and concedes a goal. But this is just confirmation bias. 
they ignore all the times when it works. But the moment a team defending like that lets a goal, then they say, look at that, they were markings only. It doesn't work. And I hear loads of people, general public, just saying, oh, stupid zonal marking, because I heard someone say it on TV. I mean, the truth of the matter is you can only measure this by actually getting statistical and working out the percentages of when it works and when it doesn't compared to the efficacy at set pieces of your opponents. And clearly, um, but... So that's zonal marking. So you have man-to-man -man marking, you have zonal marking. The truth of the matter is that it has become refined. And if you watch, what most teams will do is a hybrid of the two systems. So if you look at a set piece, you'll see we will match up a lot of best headers of the ball with their best headers of the ball quite often. But we'll also have an element of zonal marking. So often you'll see teams in the, in the six-yard box will have certain key players or certain players in key positions, which is zonal. We need someone on the near post. We need someone around the near post. We need someone in the centre six yard box. We need more defenders back, and they've got strikers coming forwards, so they cover those areas. Um, and then you'll also have man markers. So I, to switch back to teams marking us, you've got to mark Hayden. You've just got to. I mean, we've seen teams who fail to do that and with Hayden's ability to get a run in and then leap you know if you're in a standing start waiting for him to come if you're in a zonal marking role if you will and Hayden comes into your zone he will he will out jump you if you're you're from a standing start he's running onto it he's going to get higher than you he's going to win that header so you have to do something different which is why normally teams man mark Hayden and when teams don't they often get punished by Hayden um, I mean, having said all of that, uh, there are other dark arts of marking. For example, your man Mark Hayden, okay, in a straight fight, he's probably going to beat you more times than you beat him, even if you've got a good header of the ball. But you can do other things, like block him off. So you watch as well. There's a classic example of it in the penalty, not County one. The ball went to Berami on the right-hand side, and Cameron, why does he keep coming up today? Um, blocked Dolby off off the ball. You look back at it, it's really blatant. Usually it's more subtle than that. So that Dolby couldn't go to Barami, and Barami had time to to measure his cross accurately, which he did. Um, but you'll see this on set pieces if you watch. So I can't beat Hayden in the air, or I, or I don't fancy those percentages, so I'll block him off, or in a crowd, someone else will block him off for me, so he just can't get to that danger area in time. So... That's more of a man-to-man -man marking thing, really, but just with the dark arts of it. So, all right, there are nuances, Daniel. I accept that now. You're right, you talked me into it. But the truth of the matter is that um, the actual word marking doesn't have any real nuance at all. Oh, I forgot the other thing I was going to say was that when people criticise zonal marking, the reason they do it is uh, uh, yeah, and this is a, a flaw for zonal marking. If those players are marking areas, there are gaps between them. You can attack, and so sometimes it looks bad when zonal marking breaks down because a player will just run through unmarked and head it in because they've the ball's gone in the right place. Uh, maybe the zonal markers haven't reacted quickly to attack it, and they've run in. It looks like an easy goal, but like I said, it's got to be a percentage based thing, hasn't it? If that only happens once a season, zonal marking works. Um, the other danger is what I said about Hayden. If you're standing deep in the goal mouth and someone runs in on you, they're probably going to beat you. But having said that, if you're calculating it correctly, probably will be lots of corners where you'll just get rid of it because you're standing in the right spot. Uh, the downside of man-to-man -man marking, of course, is it is man-to-man, -man, and if the other person gets a better of you, you've lost. <laughs> you know? so it's, it's not infallible. Now, next thing. Craig Mooneyham. That's a wonderful name. Can you explain to some of us who aren't in on the joke what our not County friends mean when they refer to Wrexham as Salford 2.0? I'm sure it's demeaning. Just curious. Yes, it's time for me to not only answer that question, but also reveal my terrific hypocrisy. I've had to wrestle with this a little bit, that we've got money and are doing well and I'm loving it, and yet in the past I've not liked clubs who've done this. I've always sort of liked the idea of an organic growth of the team. Um, I can justify it, and I will justify it now by saying that, to be fair, although there's a lot of investments, Rob and Ryan clearly are looking to set up a club that will grow and be able to sustain itself um, so that when their money goes, we will be a bigger club than when they left. There are lots of examples of clubs who've had wealthy owners who have 
put lots of money in, had it as their plaything, but then what happens when they leave? I'll give you a couple of quick examples of this. Rushton and Diamonds, well, they, they were a merger of two little village teams down by Northampton, and they had a very wealthy owner, the man who was behind Doc Martin boots, a very Colts clothing, and they got up as far as League One, wasn't it? I'm sure they got to League One. But when he withdrew his funding, they, despite having a, a big wage bill and a lovely stadium complex, they then became almost like two village teams again, I'm afraid, and they couldn't sustain it, and they went out of business. The lovely stadium complex was mostly demolished. The stadium is now rubble. They've kept the training facilities that were next to it, which was really impressive. When you went there in later years, you could see the neglect. The ground was rusting. It was such a shame. It was lovely. Um, you know, Neath in the Welsh League were another example. They were able to pay the wages of Lee Trundle, a Wrexham cult player who, nearing the end of his career, came to train with Wrexham just to keep fit. And Wrexham were very quick to say, that it's only to keep fit. There is no way we can afford this guy. And you went to Neath, the crowd were getting crowds of 200 because they were bankrolled. And once the person got bored, they went out of business. There are examples of this, and that's, I think, what I don't like much. In general, football fans do not like clubs getting money and buying, if you will, success. Although there's something ironic about that, because surely all teams buy success. Look at the top end of the Premier League. There aren't many poor teams up there, or teams just living off the crowd. Um, so why do they mean when they say Salford 2.0? Salford were a traditional non-league club. Salford is a city which adjoins Manchester. And they had a very high-profile takeover. In fact, wait for it, there was a documentary about it um, called The Class of 92. Because The Class of 92 is a nickname for a group of young Man United players who came through, who became global superstars and propelled United to you know, a year of great success. David Beckham, Gary Neville, Phil Neville, Nicky Butt, Paul Scholes, these are all great players, all played for England, all were outstanding for United. <clears throat> so as a consortium, they bought Salford City with Peter Lim, who was a Singaporean businessman who nearly bought Liverpool about, what, gosh, 15 years ago, something like that, um, and then bought Valencia. Now, he has not been popular at Valencia, and they're currently fighting off relegation, possibly unsuccessfully, which is mad when you consider that you could argue the fourth biggest club in Spanish football. Um, so he has not been a successful owner of them, but he also came in and helped to bankroll this takeover. So the class of 92 plus Lim bought Salford City and they pumped a lot of money in and got them straight through our division and straight up into the Football League. So they are seen as a more artificial pumped up club in a way which is a shame because Salford City is actually as a club before they came in anyway was a, a good solid local team who had some non-league success so I don't think they'd ever been up to a national league level um I've got to be honest going there you could see how it was not keeping up with the the, the, the rapid movements at the table it was the only grounds I've ever been to to commentate where there was no electricity amazingly um, and the ground was sort of built up like temporary stands because their thinking was they'll just throw something up around the what bits of the structure were usable um, while they were going up the divisions and then at a later point would invest in the stands. So there was a very weird temporary feel about Salford's setup. Um, so yes, it's insulting because they're trying to say that we are the same. We are just a, a nothing club which has had money put into it and is now artificially jumping up the league. I would argue, let's not deny that the investment has made what's happening now happen. But as an awful lot of fans do say, because you see a lot of jealousy, you always will do. Every team is successful is successful is going to get jealousy. Um, an awful lot of sensible fans have said, it's nice to see proper owners like Rob and Ryan, and good luck to them. And that's it, isn't it? You know, they, they have the best interest of the club and the heart, town at heart, and I think sensible people will look at it and think yeah this is a different matter if you will this is not something that'll put money in and then get bored walk away and it'll go pop i'm not that we know salford will have that happen to them but you see what i mean and then last one for now chicago squeaky bum time what does chips for a quid mean 
seems to be slightly derogatory in use, but I can't figure out the context. I have taken guidance on this because while I'm obviously aware of it, I, I also wanted to, to hear what other people's perspectives were. So it goes back to the bad old days, not on the, that were shown on Welcome to Wrexham with Hamilton, but then the fact that we went through it all again. The different owners who look to offload the club a terrible succession of dodgy characters showed interest. Pretty much every expression of interest which went public was backed by somebody who was barred from being a director because of previous activities. Um, but one person who came up was a local hotelier and, and personality, because she also had a reality show about her, called Stephanie Booth. And there were... She was the closest one, I would say, out of all the the bidders at that time, the closest one to getting fan support because she was very good at playing the sort of populist card and, you know, a lot of people went for what she was suggesting. Now, she... <laughs> there was this bizarre, bizarre event at half-time in the match like I said, very good at playing the populist card, where she said she, she would go on the half uh, on the centre spot at half time, and announce who the owner's preferred bidder is. Now let's be honest: if you're one of the bidders and you're going to do that, I think we know what names in the envelope. But she did it. Um, she. <laughs> it was bizarre. It looked like from a distance somebody had stapled all around the envelope because it took her an absolute eternity to rip the blooming envelope open. Um, and then guess what? It was her. And she made all these promises and made this big speech in the middle of the pitch, uh, one of which was there'd be chips for a quid. And it all fell completely apart. Um, and, yeah, basically, chips for a quid has become a sort of jokey comment about ideas that you don't like. Uh, you know, they just throw out chips for a quid. Um, so, yeah, that, that I hope that explains it. I hope that explains it. Um, yeah, that was a, it, was a, it was a difficult time in our history, to be honest with you. Someone should write a book about it. Oh, go on, then. Right, anyway, uh, that's it for now, but I will do the second part of the double header later. But for now, my friends, keep watching the skies. I'm Mark Griffiths from Wrexham AFC.